Hi, this is Hosip Naparthia, and today we have with us once again Sumar Johal, Executive Director of AgStack. Talk a bit about how the what, what is Foundation doing? What is the state of the Foundation today? We've made great strides uh, in the last uh, two years since we launched uh, AgStack. Uh, we have two major projects that are now uh, generally available. Asset Registry is one of them uh, that is funded by the German government. Um, and uh, the other one is uh, around Weather Server, which is about to be launched at the heels of Asset Registry. So um, it's really been a foundational. These foundational projects are what we built, you know, started AgStack to do when we started it, which is to build this neutral and open and secure and, you know, vendor neutral uh, digital infrastructure for food and agriculture. And we're now well on that journey. Um, Several large uh, organizations have adopted it just yesterday and today. We have some folks from MIT and the World uh, FAO organization at the United Nations talk about our project and how they're bringing uh, globe-scale field boundaries uh, onto our project. So it's a really fantastic journey thus far, uh, but we're just getting started. We're at very early stages of this digital revolution. We also inked a massive, uh, very meaningful uh, memorandum of understanding, MOU, with CGIAR, which is a, uh, a consortium of research uh, uh, institutions that are at the apex of research for food and ag globally. And they advise national agriculture universities and governments. Uh, they maintain gene banks for food. And they are really ag first, and we are digital first. And so both of us are open and neutral and uh, in the public interest. And so we've partnered together, and that was the MOU we inked with them. Uh, we're going to be doing lots of things with them. And I'm very, very excited about that partnership. Uh, and there are many other things that we did along the way, which uh, have really cemented the need, the use, uh, and the benefit of AgStack as a digital public good uh, for accelerating uh, innovation in food and agriculture at globe scale. So we've been very busy. When we look at the your space, it's kind of different from CNCF, right? Because everybody is doing technology today. So what kind of challenges, you know, when you look at, you know, AgStack Foundation, where you're like, I mean, there is a lot of, you know, hurdles, you know, yes. education, awareness. So what are you seeing when you, when you go out in the field? Hey, I mean, it's like greenfield, you know? Yes, yes. Very good question. Yeah, you know, so one of the things that, you know, I think about is both the challenge and the opportunity, which are two sides of the same coin of that question. So let me talk a little bit about the opportunity first, and then I'll talk about the challenge. I think the opportunity is that when you think about, you know, think about some 14-year-old some kid in a village in, in Africa or in India or in Brazil, uh, somewhere in, a, in the global south. Uh, and if you ask that uh, child, that boy or girl, hey, um, you know, do you care about Kubernetes or do you care about cloud computing? Uh, they may not be able to tell you yes or no, but if you ask them, do you care about food? Do you care about water? Uh, I think those answers will be yes. So I think it's a very meaningful topic that engages half the world's labor force uh, globally and consumes 70% of all fresh water on the planet and feeds us all, right? And there's a massive need for digital transformation. There's a lot of leakage in the value chain. So I think the opportunity is massive. It was massive when we launched AgStack. The more I get into it, the more I see those opportunities, whether it be on fertilizer management or whether it be on financial services and land loans for farmers or whether it be in carbon credits, which is one of the things that we'll talk about. Um, you know, there's so many opportunities for digital innovation that um, I'm thrilled that uh, the Linux Foundation is actually doing something about it, and I'm thrilled to be leading that charge. I'm really delighted. It's, a life, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, so I think that's one uh, opportunity-wise, and I could talk all day about that, of course. But let's talk about the challenge to answer your question. Uh, there's no doubt that this is not Linux Foundation's core focus, right? There's no doubt about that. So why am I here? I think the reason why I'm here uh, from the Linux Foundation perspective, is that Linux has traditionally done very horizontal tech-savvy projects, but is starting to realize that actually to really make an impact in the world, uh, Linux needs to package those projects together in a way that can create disruptions for entire industries. 
So that's where automotive grade Linux happened. That's where the open source foundation for special effects in Hollywood happened. That's where LF Energy happened. That's where FinOS happened. Those are all industry specific disruptions that are basically non-horizontal, they're vertical. Um, so agriculture is something hadn't happened. And so until I came along and we both saw eye to eye, so it's really a reinvention, or I would say a pivot for a Linux Foundation to kind of make itself more, you know, useful for an industry. But then even beyond that, I think there is uh, there are industries like fintech, and then the industries like agriculture, right? Very different industries, right? In agriculture, you have a very low level of digital competence. You have huge amount number of people employed that really have never seen even. You know, any computing device besides their cell phone. Um, and so you have a, a challenge beyond the typical you know, industry, the ecosystem challenges. And they're you know, bringing in members, for example, maybe a second step, maybe the first step is bringing in grants and governments. And that's what we've been doing to catalyze this virtuous cycle that Linux is known for, where we can help enable private sector to accelerate innovation. That's what we are trying to do in agriculture, but perhaps the catalyst of that can be some grant funding. So we've been challenged by how much membership dollars we can raise from private sector in agriculture, but it's been offset by the need from governments and from other philanthropic institutions and donors to actually make that digital public good a reality. And so it's, it's really a big challenge for Linux because it's outside of their sandbox, but I give credit to the leadership team of which I'm part of to really take this head on and, and, and really delve into sustainability, impact, livelihoods at scale that is unprecedented. A few days ago, I was talking to a company that they are like, um, they are into meat production. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, they, they have clients like Tyson and everything. Right. And they were talking about the challenges that these farms had. That's know? right. Because they are like, you know, we are a big field. That's right. And there is no connectivity here. That's so right. How they're using private 5G network and a lot of small IoT-based technologies to be able to not only track, track those, that's right. but they said we have to also, you know, there are a lot of human rights issues out that's there. That's right. So, so, so uh, the thing is that uh, the, 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 the pain points are there. Absolutely. But, but we need an organization like yours, yes. actually, uh, but you know, it's, but the field it's is so... Chicken and the egg. Yes. yes. So. It is absolutely true. And, and just so, you know, to sort of harp on that one point, I think that the, these organizations not only are trying to disrupt, they have very thin margins. They don't have much money. And so, you know, food has to be affordable. And so these organizations don't have the kind of buffered, you know, general, general you know, gross margins that, that normal other tech businesses do. And so because of that, it's even more difficult for them to put out money for open source. But I will say that they have all realized that the only way to actually improve their capital efficiency, to improve their time to market, to improve their cost to market, they must use open source if it exists. So we, I, th I think it's a foregone conclusion. I think it will, it will happen, it's happening already. It just takes longer. Earlier, you're talking mentioned, you know, that you'll talk also talk about the carbon credits. So, yeah. and before we started the discussion, we talked about field carbon model project. Yeah. It is there. I also want to talk about that also because that when we talk about agriculture, uh, we also talk about environment. Before you, I had a guest from Open UK, and she was also talking about sustainability, which yes. is about the environment as well. Yes. So, talk about this project. Uh, what was the origin of this project? Yeah. So, I think the origin really comes from the fact that. Agriculture provides not just a challenge to climate, for climate change because agriculture uses such carbon heavy products, but also a solution because plants through photosynthesis actually sequester carbon dioxide. And in fact, as plant production grows, more and more CO2 is sequestered by the plants for creating food. So it's actually a carbon sink as well. So now what kind of car, you know, practices can happen where we take what is otherwise, from a carbon perspective, could be a challenge, a problem, where you're deforesting something and bringing agriculture there, your, your carbon sink is changing, to something that actually be becomes a solution, where you actually grow plants in a way that they're net carbon sequesters, and actually more and more carbon through the plant is stored in the soil. So that's where the, the conversation really starts. Can we make agriculture a net carbon sequester? And one of the free market 
ideas that has come and become quite popular lately is this notion of carbon markets for agriculture. And you know, the idea behind being, if you can quantify the net carbon savings that happen through changes in practices, or changes in crops, or what have you, then those net offsets can then be sold. And that could actually provide, sold to carbon polluters, um, and those can provide a net new income stream for farmers. Imagine the possibilities. Imagine a farmer today who's barely able to make a living selling wheat or corn or what have you. Suddenly they're able to multiply their income two, three times because they're able to also sell carbon because they're growing that wheat or corn a certain way. So that's the idea, right? Well, there are two big challenges with that idea that we are trying to solve at AgStack. First is, in order for, car for farmers to use some methodology, it has to be transparent. It cannot be locked up as proprietary code. People have to know what it is. The science has to be transparent. And so what we are trying to do first is really convene the you know, world's consortium of scientists around some pre-existing intellectual property, which is already an open source, and kind of evolve that, like Linux often does, like code, evolve that to be a transparent standard because transparency is very important. If somebody's gonna buy something, they wanna know what it is that they're buying and the methodology has to be transparent. So that's one big challenge is transparency. And the second big challenge is cost. If it takes an inordinate amount of cost to actually do this at a field level, and we're talking billions of fields across the globe, you know, you can't really have a scale uh, around a carbon market if that's the case. So how do you bring scale and cost, sort of their two sides of the same coin, into a meaningful way, a, an affordable way, so that everybody can do it? And I think both those objectives are what we're trying to achieve through the Field Carbon Project. So Field Carbon Project is an open source sub-project of AgStack. We are just launching this Friday uh, a, a technical convening starting with the first ever actual field carbon model in code, which we have actually coded with scientists in Python, and which will be available for all to see and leverages the NASA SMAP uh, project that has been going on since 2006. So NASA has uh, built a project using satellite data to create a net ecosystem exchange carbon flux product at a nine kilometer grid and that product uh, is called the SMAP uh, product, is, is going to be used as a starting point, but we're gonna take that nine kilometer grid and make it field specific. So how do we make that field specific? By getting satellite data and sensor data and activity data on a field, digitizing those through various tool sets and bringing them together into a model that can then compute the model's net ecosystem exchange of carbon flux per unit time so that people can see whether carbon is net sequestered or net emitted over a period of time. And by doing it in this way, we are unlocking both those challenges I mentioned earlier. First, by making the product, uh, the, the model completely open source, we not only set the standard which is already being used by NASA, but we all also convene scientists through our convenings to say, if you think this should be improved, why don't you improve it, right? Imagine the world's scientists all collaborating on not one, but two, but thousands of different climate models, all are version controlled, all can have a very good audit trail. And, and that's what Linux Foundation knows how to do, right? So that's, I think, the first piece. But the second piece is we're leveraging remote sensing and digital stacks and open source so that the cost of doing this becomes very affordable, right? Almost zero. And that's a game changer right there. So that's the objective of this, and the panel on Friday, we're actually going to walk through the model. We're gonna showcase some of the early results on some few fields and actual fields in, in the US. And we're hoping and pretty convinced that the whole world will rally around and build this to create a scientific consensus around the model itself and then be able to demonstrate its, its, its validity uh, for actual ground carbon flux in different areas and in, in different continents and countries. Who is involved with this project, hmm. this stage? Yeah, so we have about, we put out an open uh, invitation for the world scientists on LinkedIn or the social media sites uh, on our website. And we got about uh, 20 or so scientists uh, from all over the world 
uh, to partner with us, uh, including folks from CGIR, our partners, who already are the world scientists around agriculture and food, right? So we already have a partnership, uh, but we have made it open, not just limited to those partners. So we have about 20 or so people who volunteered uh, who are all PhDs in remote science sensing or soil physics or carbon physics and, and are have decades of experience each coming to the table and saying, I, I'm pretty excited. And they're from all over the world. They're from India, they're from the US, they're from Kenya, they're from Egypt, they're from all over the place, all over the world, which we're delighted about. So we will be forming uh, a technical uh, advisory committee from those folks. The TAC is being led by uh, Jerry Hatfield, uh, who spent 40 years uh, at the USDA, and we'll have a video from him at our Friday convening. Uh, and he's done a lot of work in uh, agronomy, but also uh, remote sensing, and he's a fantastic person to lead it. And John Kimball, who leads the laboratory for SMAP at the University of Montana for NASA. They maintain the code base. And so John Kimball and his uh, research scientist, Arthur Ensley, are the ones who are basically the co-chairs of this TAC. So essentially, that's how we're organizing it, which again is consistent with how Linux does all the governance, right? This is sort of the sandbox of governance that Linux provides, and that's why we're in a unique position to pull this off, because we have the tools to create that governance. You're talking about the cost, you know, it brings the cost down. Yes. And when we talk about some of those industries, you know, or, you know, the market, uh, first of all, they are not, as again, tech sector, you know. Right. They know how to deal with the vendor. They right. know how to get a throat to choke. Right. So when we look at this market, uh, how do you see the evolution, or you can say the commercialization of these technologies, yes. so that once again, uh, and commercialization is what makes it cost effective. Otherwise, dealing with open source is actually very, very costly. Of course. So of talk course. about what vision you have for sure, that. Sure, of course. And that's the exciting part, is that I think by building the model in open source, we're going to unlock the entire private sector, all the cloud computing companies, to take this model, compute it on their cloud. All the companies that are partnered with the cloud computing companies or their own cloud, they may have their own private cloud, where they can simply put a computer, take the model, and get the data to compute the model for field scale, and not have to defend the scientific rigor it takes to defend that my model is an actual act accurate model. They just have to compute it. Think about it this way. When Linux kernel was invented, right, what was Red Hat versus Linux business model in the first order? Linux made the operating system for free. Red Hat hosted it, period. Now, there were a few other things on top, of course, that they built up. But essentially, a hosted environment for an open source project is something that's a tried and tested thing that everybody does. Kubernetes is the same way, right? All companies use Kubernetes. It's an open source project, so they don't have to maintain the code. So we're going to maintain the model, we're going to maintain the framework. Any private sector company can basically use it and start a, their own carbon you know, supply. Essentially, they can create own carbon markets. So by doing so, we take the burden off of them for having to defend the efficacy of the scientific basis behind this. And instead, they can focus all their energy on the commercial focus, which is why it's a call to all you know, companies like who are aspiring to be carbon market players to come join us as members, push this out, get this faster out in the market so that you can make money. That's short and very simple. And that's what Linux does. Every project, that's the design. And since you talk about you know, these players and also uh, a lot of improvement, not improvement, but progress has been made in the edge computing. Of course. So because when you talk about something which is in the field, 5G and all the you know, satellite, I mean, the right technology, technology stacks are getting in place yes. to help you know, your projects, to help that vision. Which Absolutely. Is, that's what we, you need. And the, the players, and these are like commercial players. These are not for charity you know, no, projects. not at all. And one of the key things here is that it's, you, know, you mentioned sort of having a chokehold or having a moat, as they call it, in proprietary software. I think that can still exist as people bundle other proprietary services around a core open source model. So, you know, commercial open source is a very, COS, is a very known design principle in regular tech. I think agriculture companies are learning about it still. And as they learn more about it, and we can hope to accelerate that learning for them, 
I think this is basically free money for them in some ways. I mean, this is the fastest way they can make money and not have to maintain the underlying code base. When I look at the people, when they say commercial versus open source, I'm like, that's not, o open source is like cooking. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, but commercialization is uh, Uber Eats, yes. restaurant, yes. Tabas. So it's not open source versus commercial. Open source is just a collaborative model where how we can work together to write this code. Red Hat, SUSE, oh, yeah. uh, Canonical, a a AWS, M Intel, they're not commercializing open source, so there's no open source versus, you know, so. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, uh, you mentioned Kubernetes, look at the ecosystem, so oh, big, so many companies are there. That's how I expect yeah. AgStack to be. Yes. I expect AgStack to be the Kubernetes of the agriculture ecosystem. There is literally no friction between the None. commercialization and actually open source. I feel, and I may be biased because I'm also an open source journalist, is open source actually enables more commercial. That's right, it accelerates. You don't have to write all the code. That's right. That's the right. recipe is there. All you have to do is, hey, how you can deliver that chai or lassi or coffee in the way your yeah. you know, users want. So Absolutely. No, I mean, in all fairness, what will end up happening is there'll be a few early winners, mm -hmm. right? And they will lead the market in showing how you can create a billion dollar exit or what have you with commercial open source. And that's what happened with Zendesk and with MongoDB and with a bunch of these guys. Uh, and I think that once that starts to happen in AgTech and then that, that day is coming because, you know, horizontally locked silo data systems in agriculture will never scale. They just, there's too many stakeholders that need to all participate and collaborate in this sort of dance we call agriculture, right? And so it, it just will have to happen and it's going to happen. And the beauty, which is happening here uh, versus other industries is that since it's part of a neutral foundation, they don't have to worry about code getting logged by a company changing the license, you know. You, Absolutely. So, so the, it's all permissively licensed. Exactly. Yeah, it's all permissively licensed from the very beginning. We are Apache 2.0 and CD, CD, CDLA version 2.0 in all our open source and open data projects. And so uh, it is a very, friend, you know, licensed and very friendly way to encourage actually our private sector actors to use the code. So. Yeah, because when you gave some examples, you know, some of those companies, they own their own open source, of but, but they can change the license tomorrow and suddenly everybody is locked <laughs> exactly. out of that. Exactly. So, so all the right pieces are in place. Uh, Sumer, thank you so much for once again sitting down with me and also in person and talk about, you know, of course, Agistech and also a lot of projects that you folks are working on. And as usual, I would love to have you on the show again. Thank you. Thank you, Swapnil, for having me. It's always exciting to talk with you and I'm delighted to get the time. Thank you.